everyone. Welcome to the TOA Canada's 9000 M2 Series Tech Webinar. Today we'll be going over a lot of uh, tech issues that uh, our department here gets a lot of calls on. I'm just going to go through uh, various uh, installation examples and just to the common tech questions we get uh, regarding the 9000 M2. So up first we're going to go over just basically the, a rough overview of the 9000 M2. I uh, go through each uh, of the standard modules and products that are available for the new M2 version. And uh, then we'll jump right into the, the common tech questions that we usually get here on the tech departments. And I'll give you a few uh, system setup examples. So just up first here, the additional features and improvements. Uh, the M2 is basically a, a different version than the original uh, 9000 series. It does have a faster PC to unit communication. Uh, complete configuration now with the new M2 is done in 30 seconds, opposed to about roughly four to five minutes on the older version. Uh, we also have a new serial setup wizard. This allows you basically to test your serial port before even communicating with the unit and doing any uploads and downloads. It's a quick handy tool. Um, it will verify that the, the path is there and that your cables and everything are, are correct for you and do a quick test. Uh, we also we've removed the mixer or matrix switch on the back of the unit. It's now basically a consolidation of both uh, of those features into one, so there's no more switch in the, in, in the back anymore. Uh, everything is done via the programming on the, the software itself, and it's basically a lot more streamlined for you to use. Uh, last, we got the four new keypads, the new ZM series keypads. Uh, these are now connected via the RC module, and uh, a lot more flexible uh, options you can do with the new keypads, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, just some examples would be uh, initiating paging and different cross points, etc. And also mentioned, we also have the newer TOA speakers set up uh, via the EQs. Uh, before, we only had about uh, 15 to 20 approximately of the TOA speakers set up uh, on the original version. Now we have uh, over 30, and I'll include most of the newer units that we have are line arrays, etc. Uh, continuing on with additional features and improvements, we have the new telephone paging functions. Uh, I'll get into that again later on as well. Uh, basically, we have manual, auto connections, as well as group settings. And it will also increase the, extent, uh, the communication time from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. Uh, the software itself has been tweaked as well. Uh, you'll notice that there's not uh, any more multiple windows that pop up uh, like before. Uh, it's a lot more streamlined. Uh, the one complaint that we got before was when you did open multiple windows, you, you kind of lost track of what you had in the background. So now everything's done. Basically, three smaller windows for the most part, and it's a lot easier to use. Uh, front panel programming is pretty similar. Uh, we've removed a few of the button presses just to make it more streamlined, so you won't have to press you know, over arrow, up arrow, etc., all the time to go into different menu sections. It's a lot more streamlined and easier to use. And we've also tweaked the, the LCD display on the units. Uh, before, there was no timeout function on it. Uh, we've run into some issues where the front panel eventually started burning out in different sections or completely. Uh, this has been adjusted now, so after uh, 20 minutes of non-use of the front panel, it was got a scrolling text saying it's in uh, basically uh, backup mode and waiting for you know, someone to press the button to view uh, any settings you want to go to. Uh, it is compatible with the current modules and keypads as well as the 900 series modules. Uh, so keep that in mind so you don't have to buy new modules. The only thing new version that's out right now currently for it would be the 9000 uh, ZM series, the newer ones, of course, and the RC module. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the 9000 M2 series does come in uh, various different models. You have the 9060 and 9120S series. Basically, what this is a single 60 watt or a single 120 watt output units, as well as the preamp outs on the second channel there to give, uh, feed to your power amps. Uh, we also have the 240 watt version of that as well. Uh, basically give it more power on the 240 watt side of course and as well it gives you that preamp out. The 960 and 9120DH series, that's the dual 60 or dual 120. Uh, they'll give you two basically zones on board if you want to feed it to uh, either to two paging outputs or to uh, different locations that want to basically maybe share or have their own music sources. And of course the ever so popular M9000 M2 mixer units, uh, no amp on board, it does give you two line outs. And basically what that will give you is uh, outputs, uh, two separate outputs to go to your power amps. Uh, below you'll see the modules, uh, common setup of modules, the D module, which will be for your inputs, uh, microphone or line level. We also have that series in the RCA version. 
we have our T module, which is a T001T. This will give you two uh, balanced line outputs. That'll be usually fed to other power amplifiers. We have the ZP001T, which is our phone page interface module, and the AN001T, which is our ambient noise controller, and our C001T uh, contact input module. Now, you notice I mentioned er earlier the new RC001T keypad module. Basically, you'll need one of these for any of the newer style keypads. Now, this module does not work on the original 9000 series, so keep that in mind if you have an existing system and you want to use the new keypads, uh, you cannot. You basically need to go with the M2 version. Uh, that's the only one that does support the new RC module. What we can do here is basically have up to 16 of these newer style keypads on the RC module. Um, it does require a power supply depending on how many you put on there, which I'll show you a little later on. And basically how it works is the, the, the newer keypads, the 911, 912, 913, 914 are run via CAT5 shielded uh, from the RC module to each keypad. Now you can do this either daisy chain or home run. Uh, I'll show you an example of that uh, later on as well. Uh, basically just showing you the distance, et cetera, of how far you can go. Um, basically uh, we introduced these keypads because the uh, original 9001, 9002 series uh, didn't really give you much flexibility and control of uh, pulling sources and paging, etc. So these new ones here, obviously, will give you that more, more uh, easier use to use and uh, give you a lot more flexibility. So now we're going to jump into the common tech questions. Uh, myself, Bill, Danny here, we usually get a, a few calls, I'd say, uh, every week uh, based on the 9000 series. That's probably our, our most popular uh, tech call we get is on this units. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's guys in the field just to, you know, fire this unit up and just, you know, maybe not understanding fully how everything lays out. So I'm going to go into a few of the, the common questions we get on this system, uh, starting up with the basic module arrangement. Now the modules uh, you get from the TOA unit from ourselves here, uh, they're basically set up as either input or output modules and then you get your control module as well. Uh, any input module that you use has to go in slot one to four. Now that, that's basically going to be your T module, your C, uh, your sorry, your uh, ZP module, and uh, your your uh, 900 series modules. So if you're using uh, multiple modules, just line them up basically in the first four for inputs. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of the modules itself are dual inputs. So if you have a D001T, that actually physically gives you two connections, even though you're wiring that into one slot. Slots five to eight are for output slash either RC and or control modules. Now, if you're lining this up, of course, you're gonna keep it uh, in sequence. So for example, if you have only 2D modules, you're gonna put that into slot one and two. You will physically skip slot three and four because those are assigned for inputs, and then you'll start again on your output side in slot five and so on. Uh, if you have uh, 3D modules, you always put it in, again, the first three slots after each other. Never skip a slot. If you skip a slot, you always get an error message on the front panel, and it, it'll the software itself, uh, for one, will let you, but the machine itself will get confused and won't, won't even let you pass the module error code. Uh, again, always skip the spot if you're going from input to output. Uh, so keep this in mind. Uh, the 900 series modules, uh, I've had those go up to uh, about uh, five uh, loaded up. I know that they're older series, but I've had... Uh, Slots one to five views on the 900 series, and it's been uh, working fine. Uh, I wouldn't go beyond that. Uh, just I, I haven't tested that ourselves here to give you an idea how that works. Uh, but when we run into that case, when there's a uh, possible replacement of a 900 series amplifier, you got to pull a couple modules out and then load up the 9000 series that way. Um, again, uh, if you guys are stuck, obviously, always feel free to call us here at the office just to get confirmation because, we, again, we do a lot of calls on this by itself. I think we definitely help you out with that. Uh, the next thing we'll run into here in, on the module side of things is sensitivity. Now, when you load in a, a D001R, for example, that's default, uh, minus 10 dB, looking for either a CD player, or iPod, etc., something that's a line level source. However, when you flip over to the D001T, which is our most common, most popular unit, that unit there is adjustable from anywhere from minus 10 to minus 60. Now that range is there, obviously, to give you flexibility. Maybe you're jacking in a, a phone for an all-call page. Maybe you're jacking in a CD player. Maybe you're jacking in a microphone. 
So that range is there and is available to you to play with. Uh, one of the calls I get is, well, someone will load up the models correctly, plug in a microphone, press the button on the microphone to page, doesn't, nothing happens. Default uh, sensitivity on the D001T is minus 10. If you want to change that to micro level, you'll have to go either in the software and load it and bring it down to either minus 48, minus 60, uh, or do it from the front panel by basically pressing that input, uh, pressing the down arrow until you see input sensitivity like you've shown here on the screen, and just turn the parameter knob until you get down to your, your sensitivity on your mic level. Uh, mics uh, tend to be in the range anywhere from minus 30, 60, or minus 36 to minus 60. Uh, so keep that in mind. Always look at the manufacturer that you are using, hopefully ours, of course, um, on, the, on the spec sheet or in our, in our manual just to see what sensitivity they are using. Uh, I know different manufacturers tend to use, like I said, anywhere from minus 36 uh, to minus 60. Just keep that in mind when you are setting up because you don't want to obviously overdrive the input there and then give you a, a distorted sound on the output. We also have a gain adjustment on the input. So not only when you adjust your sensitivity to get it as close as you can to your sensitivity level going in, you also have your gain. So what this gain does is basically go anywhere from plus 10 down to minus 70. Now, when you're doing this, this is basically saying, I've got my sensitivity correct, now I wanna basically drive this input. So you could have, again, say a, a phone system that's just not coming through hot enough. It, you know, it, it, the phone guys are giving you an output, as an all call, you're jacking into the D module, but you can barely hear it. So what you'll do is just again go to the input, uh, press the input you want to go to. For example, input one, and right away you got your uh, gain adjustment. So you can slowly tweak that live with the parameter knob up and down, and, and get the appropriate level you want. You also visually see in the front panel the meter going up and down, showing you uh, the level it's hitting at. Obviously, if you get in the red, it's probably getting too hot. It's overdriving it. You want to stay within the green and give you a comfortable uh, level to work with. Okay, uh, up next we're going to go jump into the ZP paging module. Uh, I know this causes a lot of grief with a lot of uh, installers out there. Uh, reason being is just uh, mostly to, on, the, on the phone side of things, getting the, the phone people to give you the appropriate output. Um, a big concern that's come out recently is, are those uh, voice over IP phones. Um, they tend to only uh, give you a, a VoIP connection between their stations. Unfortunately, what we've run into recently is there could be a multiple building setup where you may have three different locations, but the head end paging connection that you want to use is located in a different building. But at the remote location where you're installing the VoIP phones and where you only have a box that's connected to the switch, for example, there is no paging output. Um, so keep that in mind when you're, you're talking to the guys that are putting a lot, a lot of VoIP installs in. Uh, if you're going to clients, obviously, maybe you're only doing the paging side to get there. You don't have a paging output. So just keep that in mind when you go to those sites. Um, just ask and, and make sure, hey, you know, I, I see you're using a voice system. Do you have a box uh, that gives me a paging output, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later here. Um, with the new ZP module uh, features, we basically have new paging modes. Uh, the three modes we have available are auto. Basically, this allows you to set up a, a predetermined auto group, per se, and that allows you to basically pick up the phone, hit the page button, connect to the ZP, and automatically go to the group that you've assigned. Manual is the same. It worked the way uh, before. You manually connect to the phone system, hit your page button, and then continue to hit, for example, 0, 01 pound for zone 1, 0, 02 pound for zone 2, and so on, uh, 0, 09 pound for all calls. That's the way it worked before, and that feature is still available. And last, we have group. Uh, this is done sort of like the auto connection, but you're doing it as predetermined groups at this stage, which are selectable. So instead of doing 0, 1 pound for zone 1, you're now doing 0, 1 pound and selecting the group that you programmed in there. So that could mean group 1 could consist of zones 1, 2, and 3, even though you're only doing a one-button press. So... It's a little more streamlined, a lot easier for you to use, uh, less button pressing, obviously, with the different features there. Um, so keep that in mind when you're programming. Just ask the client what they want to do, and you can choose the right appropriate uh, paging mode for that. Uh, we also have contact closure available now when uh, we initiate a page. That's either from a microphone or a ZP module. This is used most of the time when you do a page. Maybe you want to hit a strobe. So, for example, if you have a system that's set up as an emergency page system, 
you do a page. Now you can uh, activate one of our open collector outputs on board, which is for them there to use, uh, to trip a strobe. So a merchant page comes across. Now you're activating a strobe to give you the person a, a visual indication. The connection time has been increased as well. It used to be 30 seconds as a standard default. Uh, the engineers realized that sometimes when people are doing pages, they're actually doing announcements. So it's a little bit different than a standard page. Uh, they're doing announcements. They may be announcing uh, a certain presentation or something going on for the day. So now you have two available connection times. So it's either going to be 30 seconds or 10 minutes. Uh, the paging level has been adjusted as well. So now what you'll see is a separate paging uh, volume section, which I'll show you a little bit later here as well. What this allows you to do essentially is not only are you going to be separate from your output volume, but you're basically giving each paging zone its own level. So now not only does the paging override, but maybe you have it at a higher level than your normal outputs. So again, another uh, quick, nice feature there for you guys to use. Uh, again, that's more lean towards the emergency side of things, but again, keep that in mind. Um, when I get in that section a little later on, I'll show you where it is and, and why we use that. Connections. Here's the, here's the biggie here for the ZP module. Basically, with our ZP module, we can accept a paging connection from uh, two different ways. It's either going to be from page port or ring signal. Page port basically requires a contact closure. Um, and our mixture always, uh, as well as DTMF is available on both sides. If you don't have DTMF um, coming out of that paging port or a ring signal, it's not going to let the ZP module do what it wants to do. So basically, page port is, is a basically a line level output from the phone system. Pretty much 99% of them will have that on a, on a, a system. I, I'm familiar with the Bell uh, BCM, Nortel BCM system. Uh, it was, I remember back in the day, it was a 1 8 mini output for the line level. It also had a, a 1 8 jack right beside that with a contact closure. Uh, basically, when you're hooking it up via page port, you got to make sure there's, there's, there's the three things are active on the, from the phone guys. Basically, make sure they've given you the page output that's active when they press a button on the phone for, for one. Make sure the contact closure is engaged. Uh, I know that you can either have this toggle on or toggle off in the phone software. So keep that in mind, because sometimes, sometimes it, by default it's not turned on. If it's not turned on, it won't engage our ZP module. Lastly, make sure DTMF is available. Basically what that is, if you pick up a phone, press the buttons, you should hear that through the page system. If you do not, then obviously the DTMF is not there. Those three things must be engaged in order for our ZP module to work. If any one of those are not engaged, it's not going to work. If you flip over to the ring signal mode, that's basically treating this uh, module and that input as an analog extension. What the phone guys will do is they'll give you uh, probably a dedicated line or a phone number saying, okay, here, you jack into here, that's your own extension. Once you go there, it will open that up as a page and you're good to go. So basically what you'll do is you'll get a signed number and it'll jack into uh, our ZP module and then basically that will page uh, once it picks up. Now, with ring signal mode, it is treated as uh, sim similar to a, a fax machine. It does ring about between two and two and a half times before it picks up. Um, that's just the way it is when you're doing a ring signal, unfortunately. Uh, so keep that in mind when you are setting up a system. Um, some people don't, don't like the delay of having wait to two, two and a half rings uh, before it picks up, and they go back to page port. So again, keep that in mind. And then the one thing, again, you have to have engaged there as well is the DTMF. Again, without DTMF, without doing button presses, our ZP module won't know where anything goes. Uh, you got your basic different connections there on three and four and five. Basically, three will be for your ring signal, and four and five will be for your uh, page port connection, which I'm going to show you here in the next slide. Before I show that quick diagram here, I just want to go into a couple more things here that uh, each uh, basically output from the phone system uh, sends and what it requires on our basically ZP module. So on top of the DTMF, of course, on top of the contact closure, top of the line out for uh, paging port mode, uh, basically you look at the list here. This is all the manual, of course, uh, which I've emailed numerous times to even the phone guys that are on site saying, here's what our module requires, please make sure it's available. Uh, but basically you can do that as well. Uh, take a look at the list here anyway at the start. Again, connection for a page port, that would be line level. It's got to have uh, DTMF. Uh, shall provide no voltage make contact during page calls, so obviously no voltage going across the contact. Um, it's obviously uh, the page port uh, section on the ZP module. Uh, module. 
is uh, insensitive to whether a loop voltage, voltage exists or not, um, basically if, it, if it's reversed or not, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, just keep that in mind because a, a lot of times guys are uh, setting up systems, and again, the, the biggest biggest thing I always run across is just that, that contact closure is not engaged, so just make sure all those three things are set up and you'll be good to go. Uh, when you jump over to ring signal mode, you'll have a couple other, other things that you do require. Uh, the connection will be a, an analog two-wire connection, same way you would do as a uh, phone connection. So you will need that RJ45 or RJ sorry 31 connector there to jack into it. Signaling method again is DTMF. Uh, the reorder tone. This is all again on the phone tech guy's side. Uh, again, give them this list. Feel free to take this out of the manual and send it to them. It has uh, 120 impulses per minute or less. Uh, the loop voltage. Uh, it's going to be at least 24 volt DC or more. Uh, polarity is not an issue, but just uh, make sure that it should be, uh, be supplied from the, the phone side of things. Uh, and the uh, loop voltage should not be cut off from the beginning call uh, to the reorder tone out. Uh, this, basically, the state of the call party control break or open loop disconnect shall be reset at the phone side. Again, these are a lot of uh, more technical things that the phone guys will know about. Um, I've, again, I've given these guys uh, this cut out from the, the, the manual here, and uh, they've been quite happy to kind of say, okay, yeah, now we see what you need to do, uh, what kind of outputs you need, what kind of voltage you need, et cetera, and then they're able to basically tweak the phone side of things that way. Uh, so don't forget, because the, the phone guys have their job to do. They're basically jacking in, they're setting up their phones, and then they're giving you say, hey, I'll give you a page output and walk away. But they might not have all these features engaged, and usually you know, default software might always fire up for them and give you a line output and that's it. But no DTMF is engaged, no contact closures there, the voltage is not right. So just, you know, give them this list here, it's in our manual, send it to them, say this is what I require uh, before we get in sight and that way you know when you get there, they've done one or the other, either ring signal or page port mode. Now don't forget as well, um, we can use the D001T module input from a PA uh, uh, phone system as an all call. So if you have a, a system where you just want to do all call, don't use a ZP module. There's no point. If you're doing all call, you're, you're basically going to overkill with a ZP module. If you have a spare slot on a, on a system with a, a D module in there ready, great. Use that. Just jack it in there. It is line level going there from the phone system. Obviously, you won't need a contact closure. And basically, once it hits that D module, it's going to engage as an all call and basically allow you to page that way. Okay, so here's an example of a couple of connections here. I just stole this off the Nortel site there. There's a couple of uh, Nortel BCM units. Uh, basically, the output that you're taking here on the first one is basically for a page port. So you'll take your line level signal, which will be your uh, red signal or red line there, out of the Nortel BCM and jack it into the paging and two-wire connection. That's all you need. You'll also take your uh, contact closure output uh, from that and that will be engaged along with the line level signal at the same time and jack into the contact in. So you'll see there, all you have is four wire connection, one for your line level signal page port, and the second one for your contact closure. So long as those two are engaged, and as long as you have DTMF, you should have no issues paging with their ZP module. If the clients uh, or the phone guys only give you an analog port extension basically, uh, you have to hook it up uh, via the ring signal connection, which is the above uh, jack there, which I mentioned earlier. I'll come right out of the, the phone system. It might come off a of Bix, uh, depending on what the where location is. It might come off a of Bix block itself. Basically, you'll pull that connection off the Bix block and hardwire uh, a connector on the other end and then jack in the telephone in. Again, two and a half rings is a common time for this to pick up, so keep that in mind. Uh, once it does, you'll have the same features and functionality as you would uh, using a page port mode. And depending on what uh, ZP uh, paging options you select, you have your different uh, functionalities of your group, auto, or manual paging. So now if you continue on with the paging, I'm just going to show you the software uh, sections for this. Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier with the new uh, software interface. As soon as you load up your modules, as you see there, right now I have channel 7 assigned as my ZP module. Basically what you'll, you'll do here is um, assign it once you click on the ZP settings. So once you highlight the ZP setting, the below window shows up. So as I mentioned earlier again, you have your manual, auto, or group settings. So here, you, this screen here, you'll basically toggle, okay, I want to do manual, I want to do auto, I want to group. To the right of that, you're going to select a mode. This is either going to be paging port or ring signal. 
You also have your connection time at the bottom, which I said uh, is going to be 30 seconds to 10 minutes. You also have a, a nice, nice little feature of a pre-announced tone. Uh, that will allow you to basically uh, access your DTMF, your group, your uh, auto or manual section. Once you've engaged that, it'll give you a nice pre-announced tone beforehand. Uh, some people like that as, as more of a basically I, I, could, I call it as a, a wake up call to say hey you know a page is coming through so that'll come before you page and then you can begin to speak afterwards. Okay, and then once we get past that ZP setting, you'll notice that we have uh, an individual volume output. So below, you'll see a volume setting. Now this is uh, engaged once you go to the top left section there on the setting tab called paging volume. So now you'll notice that we have a separate paging volume section. If you look at the top right there in the dark blue section, that is our output volume. That's the default output volume that you've predetermined uh, for the machine itself. That's basically taking any source, mic or music, and using those volumes. However, when you're paging, we've now given you a different volume output. So uh, again, another call I get a lot as well is uh, people set up their output volumes that say, you know, zero or plus 10 dB, depending on the system. When they page, all of a sudden they go, oh, wait a minute, it's, it's lower. By default, your, your uh, phone paging, ZP setting paging volume uh, is minus 20. That's by default. So keep that in mind. If you're engaging different uh, levels on your output side on the top right section, you're doing all your tweaks, you're setting all your levels up based on your sources, you're happy, don't forget to adjust your, your phone paging volume. As soon as you do that, it'll be different. So right now, if I paged with the below settings, I'm going to only gonna come out of any of those outputs at minus 20. Even though I've set my main volume output at plus 10, every time I page, it reverts to the paging volume section. So just think of that as a priority. Uh, the paging volume is always set at a separate priority level, so it must be uh, changed individually per output in order to give you the, the level that you're happy with. So here we're going to look at our paging priority settings. Basically what we're giving you now on the ZP side of things is your three different levels of priority. There's one, two, or three. One being the highest and then down from there. Anything that you don't have a priority associated with, that's basically actually that's a priority uh, four, nothing. There's no priority there at all. It'll always be overridden um, by a higher priority of a one, two, or three. Now this is separate from uh, the, the scene setup. Uh, basically, if you do multiple scenes, so you're changing cross points, you're loading different uh, routing parameters, etc., your paging setup, once you engage a paging priority, that is totally independent. It's always in the background as default. to always override regardless of what you have set up in your scene settings. So keep that in mind. Uh, you'll see also we have a ducking level from 0 dB to off. This is the same as it was before. Basically, anything with a higher priority as in, say, this example, channel 7 as 1, we'll be able to completely mute channel 1, 2, 3, and 4 on this example above uh, to completely off. You can uh, tweak that any way you like, um, but most common uh, way you, you will set it up is, is off, and that's the most popular way uh, currently. Uh, you also have a, a, a time as well engaged in there, usually by default, 5 seconds. So basically 5 seconds means that if you do a page, uh, after about five seconds, the other sources, if you have background music, for example, will come back on. Uh, here we're going to show you the, the ZP setting again, continuing, uh, going to the paging group. So after we've done our ZP setting, uh, to start with the manual, your connection, of course, paging port, etc. Uh, and once you go into your priority levels and then set up your priorities the way you like, you'll come down here, and of course, don't forget your paging volume levels, you'll come down to the bottom there and, and click, uh, click your paging tab. Now this paging tab here below is basically showing me uh, how I've set up that ZP module, for example, as a group setting. So what you'll see here is I'm choosing multiple groups here. You have up to 32 different uh, paging examples or paging ideas that you can use here. That's the maximum you can load in here. That includes uh, your ZP or mic levels. So they're, not, they're all uh, set up in this one page here can't have, say, 32 different paging uh, routes set up for a mic and 32 for a phone. It's basically all shared. So if you look at the below here, number one, which is my input one, which I've selected. Number two, I've done the same thing. Number three. Now, the reason I've done three different uh, setups for the same source, if you take a look at the right, I've assigned three separate groups. So group one, I'm only paging to output one. 
group two, I'm only paging output two, and then group three, I'm going to group uh, one and two. I've also engaged the sync out. Uh, as you know, I mentioned that earlier, sync out is going to trigger those relays to activate whatever device I want. Now, they are open collectors, so you want to connect a physical relay to it. Uh, but once you do that, it will activate, say, a strobe every time I page. So now, if I did a page, I picked up the phone, and I hit uh, zero, 03 pound, that's going to activate group 3 and actually go to output 1 and 2. So now you can imagine if I had multiple outputs, say I had a fully loaded 9,000 units, I can have eight, say, possible outputs using that. I might want to do multiple groups of four to five zones. I can do that now with the new ZP module features. So here's some examples. Here's a, an auto phone page set up basically with the 9000 connected through a phone system. So I pick up my phone, I activate my uh, PBX, I hit my group setting. Uh, for this example here, I'm going to activate group number two. Group number two, what I've assigned is actual output channels two and three physically. So you'll see in the below there, I pick up the phone, hit uh, zero two pound. It's going to go through the 9,000 and output the channels 2 and 3. Uh, as well as if I did a group of uh, page maybe 0, 1, I only go into output 1. So now you can see where I have multiple areas where I can do multiple pages. And this, again, it's a great little handy feature if you want to do uh, multiple outputs. Because the problem, I wouldn't say a problem, but the, the one time consuming uh, setup we had before is when we use a ZP module. If you wanted to do groups, if I wanted to do the same setup below, I would have to pick up the phone, and hit zero, two, three pound to just select two zones. Imagine if you wanted to select five zones. I would to pick up the phone doing zero, one, two, three, four, five pound. Um, so obviously with the new group setting, we can avoid that by making a one button press and you've already predetermined that setup in the software. And here's another example here. Again, going to go into the group setup. Uh, showing as a zero, 01 pound, and now I'm selecting this group as only 1, 2, and 5, where I have a different group right beside that. If you look below, of output uh, 3 and 4, uh, zone group 3 is output 6 and 7, and zone group 4 is output 8. So again, now you see I can have load up multiple groups again and page different outputs uh, at any, any way I wish, essentially, depending on how you guys set this system up. Now our new keypads, um, I get a, quite a few questions on this as well, uh, mostly due because of the wiring, et cetera, and uh, the, the fault messages and stuff that you see, which I'll get into a little later on. Uh, what I want to talk about first is basically what these new keypads do. Now I'm only talking about the new 9000 series, the 911, 912, 913, 914, the ones that are connected basically via CAT5 shielded. Basically what these buttons and volume attenuators now allow you to do is do uh, scene changing and loading. We could also initiate uh, cross points, basically allowing me to turn on or off inputs and writing them any, any way I want. I could also use the button to initiate a page. I could also use the button to initiate an open collector output on the box itself. And I can assign an individual or multiple inputs or output volumes to the volume attenuator. This all also gives you a nice LED feedback uh, on the keypad itself. And this, you know, this is more of an easy use to kind of show you what you've done and what you've paged. Um, and, and, and give uh, people a visual indication as well if they have multiple buttons pressed, uh, particularly if you use the eight button keypad where they may have, you know, maybe press a button, an extra button they didn't want to, they could turn that off afterwards. So here's the wiring. Again, uh, a big call we get on this is, well, you know, how many can I load up? What kind of wire do I need? Uh, we need and where, you know, how far I can go. Yeah, in the manual, it states it has to be CAT5 shielded. Um, this is the recommended wire for our keypads. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're doing an installation that you do get CAT5 shielded run. Um, if you're doing a run that's going to show you uh, a home run, basically, so a setup of maybe multiple keypads up to eight, all home run to your connections, you can go uh, just over 2,600 feet. Now, you'll see an example above. The RC module has two connections. Basically, if you're using the first input there, you can use up to eight keypads. 
Uh, anytime you have anywhere from one to eight keypads, you do require one power supply, which is AD246. Anything time you go above eight keypads, you have to use a second terminal connection below uh, and basically use another power supply. Um, it, it, keep that in mind because a lot of times the one thing we forget to maybe uh, mention is you do need a power supply. Um, if you don't have a power supply, obviously you need to do a 24 volt DC supply, uh, hopefully handy with you when you're on site. Um, I, I do get a few calls again that you know guys on site and they just don't have a power supply with them. So just make sure you do order one if you are using the new RC uh, module, and uh, make sure you also use uh, the appropriate wire for this setup. And uh, here's a, another example using everything daisy chain. Now, when you're daisy chaining, um, you will have to go uh, into the connection and then out to the next keypad. Um, if you look at the above example there with that RC module, again, you see the two connections there, the first, um, there first five there and the, and the second five terminal strips there uh, on top of each other. Basically, that's going to be, the top one will be for your first link and then the second one will be for your second link. Uh, again, two power supplies will be required. If you are doing this type of setup from keypad to keypad, like a daisy chain setup, the yeah, maximum you can go uh, drops down to 656 feet. Uh, if you are doing a multiple keypad setup, um, best way to do it that uh, we found here is if you're going from keypad to keypad, what you want to do is go into the, the link A input, which is the top terminal connection, the top five wire terminal connection, then come out of the bottom five and go into the top one or the next one and so on and so on. That way you don't load up the wires, obviously, because they're such a small terminal block. So you're going to go into the top section, out of the bottom to the next keypad and so on and so on. And uh, I just showed the example here below, just showing this style of keypad, the ZM911. You don't have to limit yourself to, say, the same keypad. You can mix and match them any way you, you wish. That's all done in the software, determining on which keypad you use and which address you sign to them. And speaking of which, uh, keypad addressing. Every keypad we have has a, an adjustment uh, on the either the back or top of the keypad, depending on which one you go with. And basically a little dial there saying, you know, which my address. Uh, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, which is your first uh, uh, string of uh, letters. And then you got 0 to 9 to give you your uh, addressing to your 1 to 16, essentially. So every time you do a, a setup in the software, it's going to ask you, okay, you have keypad 1. What's your address? So you have to address these individually based on uh, address you choose. So, for example, if you have four keypads, maybe you want to use 0, 1, 2, 3. So first keypad would be 0, second keypad 1, third keypad 2, fourth keypad number 3. So make sure um, first thing you do before you put in the wall, <laughs> I get those calls too where the keypad doesn't you know, register. Before you put in the wall, is make sure you address them and make sure all addresses are correct uh, before you load it in the wall there. And then you should have no issues connecting to those keypads. So once you've done your connections to your keypads and you've uh, plugged in your power supply to the RC module, you've fired up the units, what happens? You'll get a fault. This is common. Don't worry about that because every time you put an RC module and load the keypads, by default, the machine is going to give you a fault. Um, it's kind of a harsh word to use because we use that fault indication for other things on the 9000, but it is only the only error message we currently have on the front panel. What this is saying basically is if you haven't done any programming and loaded it to the 9000, it's basically telling you that, okay, I have keypads here, but they're not assigned to do anything, so I'm going to give you a fault message. So again, don't get scared. Don't get worried that you see a fault flashing on the front. That's normal. Until you program the keypads buttons, and it's a volume attenuator telling you what you want it to do, you'll get the fault message regardless. So what you have to do is run over your software, go to the remote uh, keypad setting wizard, and pop up this window like this. So this example here, I'm showing you a keypad, which is a Z ZM9014. I've addressed it there as number zero, and now I've got the four buttons showing on the top. So what I've done with this one is uh, channel one, input, sorry, button one, I'm loading it as a scene one load. Channel two, I'm changing cross point. I'm basically telling it when I press button two, I want input one to go to output one and input two to go to output two. My button three is initiated paging. I have a microphone hooked up to it. I want to press button three, initiated page, and set up as an all call. Button four, I'm saying that as uh, activating my open collector output. 
Basically, this is saying is uh, I'm going to press this button to trip uh, an open collector output and activate a relay. And lastly, uh, my volume. My input and, vol and output volume are available. And for this setup here, I've engaged it to um, set up and uh, attenuate both uh, my output volumes. Now, the one thing we don't currently have an option as right now is if I press, uh, say, button two in this setup, I cannot have that volume control attenuator on that keypad follow across point selection. I know you guys ask a lot of times is say, well, say I have my four buttons, each one's turning on a source, I want to adjust the input gain of the sources. Unfortunately, I can't do that currently with this setup. I can't have the button and the volume control basically follow each other every time it's pressed. So it will not do that. So keep that in mind. If you wanted to say control multiple um, sources and their input gains, you'll have to have multiple uh, volume knob attenuators itself separately in order to do that. So I just mentioned that section before when I press the uh, button 2 there to initiate my cross points. This is what happens when you do use that pull down menu to say, you know, I want, I want to activate a cross point. This little window here pops up. Basically it's saying, okay, you're pressing this button, what do you want to do? Uh, basically, you're going to do uh, select either uh, your multiple ins or outs or maybe individual ones. You do this based on what your preference is. Once you select that, hit OK. That is now assigned to that uh, button. Okay, so once. It looks like I lost my recording there, so I'll pick this up live here. Um, basically, the software, like I mentioned before, does have a, a brand new interface. Um, it's basically a, a lot uh, different than the original software, minus the Windows. Uh, it can only be used on the M2 series of uh, uh, machines, so you cannot, say, get an M2 machine, get the software either from the disk or from our website there, and then try to load it uh, and use it on the original series. It does not work. Uh, so if you have the original 9000 series, keep that in mind, you have to still have that original software. If you have the M2 series, you must use the M2 software. Uh, like we showed there earlier, uh, there's multiple menus available on the screen. Uh, we do have separate menus now for our keypads. Uh, our speaker EQs are now uh, obviously cranked up from the original, say, 15 or 20, so we had originally. They now go uh, up to our about 30 current uh, TOA product models that we do have. Uh, plus, uh, when you do select a, a speaker uh, from the pull-down menu, it'll actually show you the speaker EQ now in a visual graph. So you can get, a, get an idea of, like, hey, you know, there's my uh, EQ curve, and it gives you an idea of how that uh, speaker will respond. Um, the initial setup now allows you to pull uh, the last file used. So if you do fire up the software right away, your, your last default file comes up. Uh, I know it's not much, but it is a handy feature if you are uh, loading up, say, multiple 9000s, all the same file. You don't have to go searching for that anymore. So when you fire the software, this is the menu again. Again, we got the new file option on the top right. As you see here, it's pulling my original one on the left-hand side there is the one I worked on last. If I wanted to use that one, all i got to do is click on existing file, and I'll use the one I've used last. If I want to open up a new one, all i got to do is click on browse. And again, it's a browse the same way as you would search for anything else. This is a browse. What you can also do is I can do a serial setting wizard right off the bat. So if I'm not sure if I have a connection, right away I can do that serial setting wizard and connect to the unit and make sure my connection is valid. And as w uh, lastly, a nice little feature is I can actually download 9000 to PC right away. Uh, before I had to again, you know, open up the units, uh, open up the software, get into the main body of the software in order to do that. Now I can. Once I get into the start menu, I can just right away download the 9000 PC and it'll load everything the way uh, I want it. Okay, so once you get past that screen, you now you have your main window. This is very similar to the way it was before. You just start loading your modules. Now, another cool little feature is if you're on site, you have the software, uh, it might be your first 9000 you're using, or you're just unsure with the model that you have. Where they go, I know we spoke about this before, your inputs go to 1 to 4, outputs go to 5 to 8. Maybe you're not sure, go to the software. Every time you use the software, it'll tell you what models can be loaded into each slot. It'll basically blank out or won't let you put in models that you can't put in. So, for example, slot 1, if you try to put in a T model, say, uh-uh, can't do it. So, 
just uh, keep that in mind. If you're stuck, software's are a good key. I still use that sometimes just to verify I can load up a system with certain modules or maybe what order they go in. Uh, once you do that, just load up the way with the models you have. The software will give you that feedback saying, yes, you can use two Ds, like in this example, use your 1AN, use your ZP, and then the rest of them fall down below. Uh, once you've done that, on the right-hand side, you have your output names. You have basically seven characters there to use um, to type in what outputs you want. Uh, or inputs as well. For this example here, I've got like one to four labeled, uh, and I got different sources labeled, etc. Just you know, showing it through and different things here to show you what I've got set up. And then once you complete that screen, your input screen, this is the default one you get. So now, like I said, on the left, you got your scene saving setup. Your top section is going to be your input and output section. And then once you click on any of uh, those button tabs on the top, either the volume, EQ, compressor, gates, AN settings, your delays, that'll all populate now on the bottom. Or if you forward, always open up a new window. So again, click on any button on the top, it's going to pop up whatever you choose on the bottom. So for this example here, I chose uh, on, on the top there my uh, mic input volume number one. It not only populates number one, but it gives you all four as well. So now you can just bounce through different inputs and adjust the settings the way you want, and then go maybe over to your output section. Again, it'll populate that on the bottom window, and you can bounce through those outputs and go from there. So again, a lot more easier to use, a lot more streamlined. Uh, I get a lot of great comments now based on this, just on the more advanced features. Uh, obviously, a lot uh, more streamlined. So you know, get familiar with it. It's a little different than before, but once you're familiar with it, you'll, you'll see it's a lot easier to kind of work with. Uh, now we're going to go on to uh, cross points. Once you click on the cross point section at the top, again, it uh, populates on the bottom. This is basically saying, by default, where do you want these inputs and outputs to kind of be arranged? If you look at the bottom there, your inputs kind of go from uh, 1 to 8, and they go down. Your outputs go from 1 to 8 again, but they go across the right. Anytime you click on that section uh, with an orange and black X through it, that's saying that input is going to that output. If it's blank, if it's white, it means it's not going there. Now, the one thing we've noticed as well is when you're using the new keypads and you have those engaged as activating cross points, make sure you go back to the default window like I'm showing you here and turn off any cross points that you have associated with the keypads off. Because what you're doing here is here, you're basically telling it, well, my default cross points, I want it to go here. But then if you start using the keypad to toggle all things on and off, the machine's going to say get, get confused because it's basically saying, "Well, you've told me to, you know, press by pressing this button, I'm going here, but yet my default cross point's on or off, and it kind of gets, you know, uh, messed up that way." So, if you're using the keypads for your cross point selection, always go back to the main cross point window like you see here and turn those off. Once you do that, then you're relying on those keypads that you've assigned those buttons to and assigned those cross points on or off to do all the work. Once you've done that, you're uh, good to go. Uh, up next here, again, I'm just going to show you a different example with the uh, multiple paging. Uh, I showed you earlier the phone paging. Now I'm going to show you mic and phone paging. Same scenario. I got the priorities uh, set up at the top there. So you see number seven is priority one. Mic one and two are priority two and three. Once I've associated those priorities with those inputs, uh, my below window becomes available. And under the input section on the below window, I can start loading up my inputs. Again, you can have... The same input do different things. Uh, for example, I have number one is input one. I'm going to say my remote switch one. Again, that's telling me my keypad one that I've assigned a paging button to. I'm going to page it to output one and two. Yet, uh, if I do input one again and press the keypad button two, I am now going to output three and four. So now you can see uh, this section here where my multiple paging structure is all set up. So the first four there, I've assigned that all to input number one. But I've had different triggers, as in my, my buttons, one to four, doing different things. They're going to different paths. So once you start loading that up, you get a good idea of, okay, now I can have different keypads or different mics as an all call or and or my phone to go to different routes. Again, 32 is the maximum you can do. Um, if you have multiple keypads and multiple mics and a phone, uh, just you know keep that in mind. Remember that I can do 32 paths. Obviously, every separate path you want to do, 
does require um, an initiate page, and that does take up one of the 32 inputs. Uh, the remote control wizard, we kind of went through this briefly before. Uh, I show you an example here of this one here. Basically, I've assigned the address zero. Uh, this one's going to be my setup as my phone page keypad, like the kind of previous screen there. So basically, the first four buttons there, I've assigned those as initiate page. Now, the next one here, I've assigned it saying, I'm going to go with your ZM912. Again, address one, always different. But I'm going to assign that as an output volume. So maybe you have a volume attenuator located remotely somewhere. Anytime someone goes, this is a volume control now, I'm telling it, I want to go to output volume one, two, and five and six. But notice how I've skipped three and four there. So you can gang up or load up multiple outputs or inputs or individual if you want and have that associated with now with one attenuator via the newer uh, series of ZM keypads. And here's the, the big beast, the eight button version. Uh, this one we tend to use for doing multiple paging uh, zones, uh, one to eight, for example. Um, but in this example here, I'm showing as changing scenes and changing my open collector outputs. So the first buttons I've assigned to this one is basically changing scene one to four by you know, using button one to four. And then five to eight, I'm basically changing my open collector outputs and uh, activating them that way. And another example here, this is the 9014 keypad. This is one of our more popular uh, units. It gives you four buttons on board plus the volume attenuator, so it's kind of the best of both worlds there. Um, again, being my most popular, because four buttons use you essentially enough to give you uh, a lot of control as well as the volume there to give you an output to go to the output volume. Uh, so this example here, I just chose a cross point uh, example one, um, basically pressing button one, taking input three to output one, uh, input three to output two, and so on. You see how it's kind of uh, cut off there. If you do click on that down arrow, it will show you the rest of the inputs and output cross points you selected. It's only big enough, obviously, to fit uh, the first kind of four or five options there, but they all are, are all there once they've been programmed. As well as I've told it that it's okay, well, I want to adjust the input volume for all uh, seven inputs. Uh, again, as a showing example, you probably would want to do this. Um, and again, keep in mind, I can't have the button follow or vice versa, have the volume control follow the button press. Um, uh, we, we are hopefully going to get that maybe sorted out. Um, but until then, if you do want individual gain control based on button press, you'd have to have a separate attenuator assigned to that input and a separate button keypad for that uh, setup, basically. And uh, a nice little example here of a multi-room controller and setup example. Here I've got a, basically almost a fully loaded 9000. A CD player, a satellite receiver, a tuner, a DVD player, a jukebox, whatever you want to jack in there, basically. And my mics, i got different keypads different, doing different things. If you take a look around there, i got a patio, dining room, kitchen, waiting area. I've got a, a ZM 9014 assigned to each one of those individually. And those keypads can do different things. They can, again, can page. I can turn on and off different sources, or I like to say is pull different sources from the 9000 and only route them to those particular areas as well as have the volume control assigned to those outputs. So again, now you can see you can load up a multi-input multi and multi-output system and have the keypads there set to control uh, individual areas. So it's great for uh, bars that have uh, different setups and different waiting areas, et cetera, where you can say, okay, you know, the bar guys, here's your, here's your volume control attenuator with your four buttons. This is your sources. Do what you need to do. Whereas a restaurant area might have a certain set, different setup with different sources, different music, they can uh, feel free to use it that way. All right, and I'm going to get into the last few slides here. Use an example of room combining. Um, when you would be basically do this, we're you know, pretty comfortable doing a, a two-room combine with this setup. Basically what this is saying is you might have a hall A, a hall B. At certain times of day, uh, someone might want to come in and use like a master keypad like a below there and say, um, individually from, uh, say, 12 to 5, I want Hall A and Hall B to be separate. So you can have those keypads individually in those halls, uh, playing with their local sources only and their local volume to those outputs and, and working independently. Uh, but possibly after, say, 5, you want to load scene 2, and now that's going to, say, blow that wall out in between them. They physically move that, of course, and now Hall A and Hall B become combined. So we can do that uh, pretty comfortably with the 9,000. 
Now that way you can pull multiple, say, sources, have multiple mics all working together or separately depending on how you want to set up your rooms.